Hi, I'm Johnny Engineer Turmel, running for Prime Minister of Canada in the 2011 election, and I'm here to tell you why low-level radiation is so dangerous. When you hear them say on TV, oh, low-level radiation, not dangerous, they're lying. Now you got to know why it's dangerous, what to do about it. Deadly deceit, low-level radiation, high-level cover-up, J.M. Gould, Benjamin A. Goldman. This is the overview I'm going to read. Radiation released by nuclear technologies has had a fearsome effect on the environment and human health. Since the atomic bomb attacks on Japan in 1945, considerable research has focused on the health effects of radiation. Early studies examined the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Subsequent laboratory experiments studied analogous kinds of whole body irradiation. The conventional wisdom from this substantial body of research is that high doses of radiation caused by bomb blasts can seriously injure human health, but that small doses of radioactive fallout, often called low-level radiation, do little harm. There is now reason to fear that low-level radiation from fallout and from nuclear reactors may have done far more damage to humans and other living things than previously thought, and that the continued operation of civilian and military nuclear reactors may do irreversible harm to future generations as well. Already maybe too late. The chief findings in this book revolve around statistical estimates of excess deaths that have never been for been part of the public debate on the dangers of low-level radiation. They may shock the general reader because there has been a sustained effort to withhold official data from the public. Nuclear physicists realized as early as 1943 that fission products released into the atmosphere could enter the food chain and when ingested could accelerate the deaths of millions of persons worldwide. As related in Chapter 7, Linus Pauling and Andrei Sakharov calculated in 1958 that millions of people would die prematurely from the ingestion of fission products resulting from fallout from atmospheric bomb tests. Today, we're in a position to review the official U.S. mortality statistics for nearly nine decades of the 20th century to find that the chilling predictions of Pauling and Sakharov may have been fulfilled not only during the period of atmospheric bomb tests, but after every major accidental release of nuclear fission products. Most previous studies of the health effects of low-level radiation were based on theoretical extrapolations of how many cancer deaths can be expected from exposure to high-level radiation, taken from the experience of Hiroshima and Nagasaki victims. In this book, we take a completely different pragmatic approach. Guided by the pioneering work of radiation physicist Ernest Sternglass and physician and epidemiologist Carl Johnson, we analyze the mortality data collected from official death certificates filed in the wake of large radiation fallouts. In this way, we can estimate the dose response to low-level radiation after the fact rather than a matter of a theoretical speculation. As statisticians, we define an excess number of deaths at any time and place as the difference between the number of deaths actually observed and the number that would be expected based on national norms when that difference is too great to be attributed to chance. We have found that releases of low-level radiation from nuclear power and weapons plant reactors have consistently been followed by large numbers of excess deaths. Sort of like when Roosevelt banned all the community currencies during the Great Depression and there were 7 million excess deaths over the, what was expected. Radiation from the April 26, 1986 Chernobyl disaster, which reached the U.S. early in May, okay, a week later, was followed almost immediately by an extraordinary force of mortality amounting to perhaps 40,000 excess deaths in the summer months, especially in the month of May. The acceleration in deaths particularly affected the very young, the very old, and those suffering from infectious diseases such as AIDS, suggesting that the ingestion of Chernobyl fission products had an immediate adverse impact on those with vulnerable immune systems. 
The Chernobyl disaster released so large a volume of fission products into the atmosphere so quickly that its immediate effects, though thousands of miles from the source, were revealed by the analysis of the official monthly mortality reports of two nations that make such data publicly available, the U.S. and West Germany. Our results were unexpected, but when we went back to examine the mortality data associated with previous large nuclear releases, we found the same pattern of excess deaths among the very young and very old. We found immediate increases in infant mortality and in total deaths, primarily comprising older persons, which were followed later by annual increases in excess cancer deaths. These excess deaths may be linked to damaged immune systems from the ingestion of fission products, in particular radioactive iodine, which damages fetal thyroids, and radio radioactive strontium, which concentrates in the bone marrow. This book can be viewed as an epidemiological whodunit with the suspect revealed by Chernobyl in 1986 and the web of circumstantial evidence traced back to 1945. One notable use of our related databases was a report by Greenpeace USA that demonstrated the toxicity of the Mississippi River. Greenpeace found that from 1968 to 1983, there were some 66,000 excess deaths in the counties bordering the river, a figure greater than the number of Americans who died in the Vietnam War. In this book, we found similar disturbing clusters of excess deaths associated with radiation releases. A sampling follows. Between 50,000 and 100,000 excess deaths occurred after releases from accidents at the Savannah River Nuclear Weapons Facility in 1970, and again at Three Mile Island in 1979. <clears throat> the 1970s Savannah River reactor rod meltdowns were revealed in congressional hearings uh, after 18 years of official concealment. 100,000 people died, and they hit it. The government claims that no radiation was released as a result of the accident. Yet, because the Savannah River facility is under military control, accurate emissions data are not publicly available. The significant increases in excess deaths suggest a substantial release may in fact have occurred. The Brookhaven National Laboratory has documented hundreds, if not thousands, of routine and accidental civilian reactor releases since the mid-60s the largest of which occurred at Three Mile Island in 1979. As in the Savannah River case, excess infant deaths from birth defects increased significantly after the Three Mile Island accident, as did excess deaths from child cancer, lung cancer, heart diseases, and other causes. Chapter 6 provides evidence of official concealment and falsification of key data on radiation and its health effects indicating why these findings have never been made public before. We believe that the cumulative magnitude of atmospheric nuclear weapons testing may explain what has hitherto been a great epidemiological mystery. In the 1950 to 1965 period, mortality statistics inexplicably stopped getting better. After decades of improvement going back to the discovery of antisepsis early in the 19th century, during this period, the volume of fission products released into the atmosphere was equivalent to the explosion of some 40,000 Hiroshima bombs. This terrifying figure was known to the leaders of the Soviet Union, who were responsible for two-thirds of the total yield, most of which occurred in 61 and 62, and to Presidents Eisenhower and Kennedy. Although the magnitude of the nuclear orgy was not publicized at the time, it led to the U.S.-Soviet agreement to ban atmospheric bomb tests in 1963, after which mortality rates resumed their annual, though somewhat diminished, improvement. Kennedy Khrushchev, good boy. Many members of the baby boom generation who were born into the nuclear age sustained an observable degree of immune system damage. The successive cohorts of persons born since 1945 who were exposed to ingestion, ingested fission products in utero, at birth, or in early childhood are now registering ominous increases in their mortality rates. That's my generation. These generations are disproportionately affected by a wide range of immune deficiency diseases, including AIMS, chronic Epstein-Barr virus, known as yuppie influenza, or chronic fatigue syndrome, and many others. The heretical hypothesis, first advanced by a radiation physicist 
Ernest Sternglass and, and Jen Shear that may explain why AIDS first emerged in wetlands Africa in 1980. These areas of high rainfall received the highest fallout during the years of atmospheric bomb tests. They didn't do it near to the states and Russia, they did it near to Africa. In our effort to investigate this epidemic at the local level, we found that publication of cancer mortality data by township routinely available from the Connecticut Department of Health and Services since the 1930s was terminated in 1977. We think that post-1976 mortality and morbidity data for the towns close to Millstone reactors may also throw light on the outbreak of Lyme disease first reported in the area near Millstone during the fall of 1975. An equally startling hypothesis is posed in Chapter 8, where we suggest that fresh milk from dairy farms near nuclear reactors may have contributed, along with the increased poverty and other causes, to deteriorating infant mortality in certain urban areas over the past two decades. This hypothesis was suggested to us by statistics related to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's unprecedented closing of the Peach Bottom reactors on the border of Pennsylvania and Maryland on March 31st, 1987 because of operator negligence going back to 1974, 13 years before they were shut down. The reactors had a long record of excessive releases of short-lived radioactive element iodine-131. The Peach Bottom reactors are located in one of the nation's most productive dairy farming areas, which supplies fresh milk to the entire Mid-Atlantic area, including the citizens of Baltimore and Washington, D.C. After Peach Bottom was closed in the summer of 87, infant mortality in Washington, D.C. plunged to the best rates in some 20 years. This evidence suggests that the dose response is supralinear rather than linear which means that infant mortality rises more rapidly at low doses. Low-level radiation may be more dangerous than high-level radiation. Another example of the supralinear relationship was offered in the wake of Chernobyl. The June 1986 increase in infant deaths over June 1985 in the U.S. was a full 10% of the increase in West Germany's Baden-Württemberg province even though U.S. radiation levels were only one one-hundredth to one one-thousandth as great. So you take the square root of the hundred, and whoa, it's ten. So you would have expected a lot more, a hundred times more dead people in Germany, and you only had ten times more. This crucial evidence supports the 1972 laboratory findings of Dr. Abram Petkow, a Canadian radiation biologist, on the dangerous effects of free radicals created by exposure to low-level radiation. Free radicals are charged particles that can penetrate and destroy the blood cells of the immune system, especially at low levels of radiation. Our findings of a supralinear effect also agree with similar findings for cancer mortality from exposures to low-level radiation made by four eminent authorities. All four scientists worked at various times for the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission or Department of Energy. All four concluded that the dose-response relationship was supralinear, which means that there is no level of radiation low enough to be deemed safe. The government terminated the services of all four when they each independently came up with what Dr. Goffman has called the wrong answer. That is, the opposite of what the AEC wanted to hear. The superlinear dose response, more dangerous at low level, for infant mortality may apply to all deaths from immune system damage caused by radiation-induced free radicals, the so-called pet cow effect, that without fundamental change, the death rates of all age groups will begin to rise in the 21st century, canceling out previous advances in longevity. The statistical probability is less than one in a million that during the summer following the Chernobyl accident, the excess deaths observed in the U.S. were due to chance. Equally improbable were the excess deaths observed in West Germany during the same period, and as related in Chapter 3, Ornithologist David Visanti found at the same time that the number of newly hatched land birds counted by the Point Rise Bird Observatory in California in the late spring and summer of 1986 dropped 62% below the average of the previous decade. This book is a challenge to the scientific community to identify plausible alternative explanations. There are none for a million to one shot. 
The charges made here are too important to be left to experts for resolution. Continued reliance on nuclear technologies may pose an ongoing threat to life on Earth. The potential danger warrants the widest possible audience and public debate. So, this book was written in 1991, 20 years ago, and nothing has been done.